you have your Bible with you this morning, I ask you to open it and put your bookmark in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, we'll spend uh, all of our time in this passage of Scripture this morning, so I uh, hope that you will uh, go ahead and prepare for that. Uh, good to see you this morning. A lot of folks still out because of the holiday. A lot of folks traveling uh, with the New Year weekend, and uh, it is hard for me to believe that I told Trace this morning that uh, 2023 is over. I, I mean, I remember when, you know, the clocks rolled over at 2000. You, you remember that? And uh, everybody thought the world was going to come to an end because the computers didn't know how to handle uh, that many ones and zeros and stuff. And man, that was 23 years ago. Uh, that, that is just hard for me to believe. Uh, you younger folks, I, I hate to sound like an old man, but this is what happens when you get old. You have no clue how fast life is going. So uh, enjoy every minute of it because tomorrow you're going to be 74 years old. Uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy uh, this day before you turn 74. So good to see you this morning. Uh, our condolences to Ken uh, and to his family, uh, to John, Tom, and to Beverly and, and their families. I, I tell you, folks, it... it uh, I told Beverly yesterday, uh, one, one thing about getting older, uh, you, you just go to more and more funerals. And you just, uh, you know, I know young people pass away too, but mercy. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is a reason to have hope in the Lord when you recognize how short life is and how, how often uh, people are dealing with the, the loss of loved ones. And so uh, we grieve with you guys. Uh, we, we pray for you guys. Uh, and... Uh, Hope that you can take assurance uh, in, uh, in, in the grace and the mercy of our great God and the hope of the resurrection. So, uh, th this being the year's end, I don't know how you deal with the end of the year. Uh, this is a, probably an expected kind of introduction uh, this morning. Uh, the, the end of things bring reflection. Uh, the, the, whether it's the end of, a, uh, you, you know, of an educational career, the end of a school year, the end of a... Uh, of, a, of a job cycle, uh, the, the, the end of a year. And I don't know how you deal with that. Some people become very, very reflective. Uh, some of that is necessary. If, you, uh, if you're a business owner, if you're very serious about financial circumstances, the end of the year is generally where you kind of take stock of where you are and where you're going to be and what kind of tax burden that you've got in front of you and what kind of things need to be done. That's a, a natural part of the financial cycle that we all deal with. Uh, if you're a younger person and, and, and you are moving from school year to school year, uh, the end of this particular year doesn't necessarily change much because you're mid-semester, but with the end of things, you start looking toward the, the next year and what that's going to demand and uh, what kind of opportunities there are. And, uh, the end of things and the beginning of things just bring some degree of reflection even for those of us who don't necessarily take the time to evaluate and offer some New Year's resolution. I found out a long time ago, uh, New Year's resolutions for me just made me frustrated. And what I have learned is I'm a whole lot happier if I don't make them, uh, because that way I don't break them the day after tomorrow. Now that being said, if we are going to give some time to reflection in whatever reason, in whatever area of life that we may do so, I, I do think the end of a year is a good time to give time for spiritual reflection. Uh, sometimes we do that uh, collectively as a congregation. Larry's going to speak for us next Sunday on behalf of the elders. I don't know what he's going to talk about. I, I, I would assume there's going to be some uh, area of reflection on who we are, where we are, what we should be doing, what we have done, what we haven't done. I think that's a natural process, and I think it's absolutely fundamental for Christians. If you're not doing it all the time, and this is kind of one way to go about this idea of reflection and planning, some people just kind of do that regularly. That's, that's kind of the way I operate, of generally working on something spiritually. Uh, but for some people, you, you need a kind of a, a marker, a, a, a distinction, at uh, the end of December, the beginning of January, and here's where I've been, here's what I've done, here's what I haven't done well, here's what I have done well, here's what I need to work on, uh, here are things personally perhaps that I need to give some consideration to, here are things perhaps in regards to my relationship to the church that I need to give some consideration to, it's a time for me to make some goals. Now, if you are a person who does that, 
on a time frame. Let me suggest to you, it's time. It's time for you to start thinking about the next year. Uh, what, what are you going to do in regards to the Lord in, in, in your character? What are you going to do in regards to the Lord uh, in your relationship with the world? What are you going to do in regards to the Lord in relationship with your family? What are you going to do in regards to the Lord in the relationship with your friends? What are you going to do in regards to the Lord in your relationship with this congregation? I'm, I'm going to tell you why that is so important. Because the Lord's coming back. I'm going to start this lesson and end it the same way. If you knew the Lord was coming back on April the 24th, 2024, and I picked that date on purpose, 4-24-24, easy to remember. The Lord's coming back. I would think we wouldn't need a lot of help remembering the Lord's coming back, but let's for argument's sake. The Lord's coming back. The world's going to end on April the 24th, 2024. Would you live any differently in the next four months? In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter brings his second epistle to a conclusion. And, and really nearly all of the second epistle addresses kind of the, the, the same idea. Uh, and that is that uh, there are people that are going to try to mislead you about a number of things and you need to beware of false teachers and you need to understand the implications. And when he gets to 2 Peter chapter 3, he's going to talk about those who call into question the idea that the Lord's coming back. Uh, turn there and read with me, if you would. And I want to make four very simple points that we need to think about from this passage of Scripture as the year is ending and a new one's beginning since the Lord's coming back on April the 24th, 2024. Beloved, I now write to you uh, this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of His coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the Scriptures. Therefore you, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let me suggest to you, here's the commonality we have with the people that Peter is speaking to. First of all, I think we just get so busy in life that we forget that the Lord's coming. 
Uh, Emily and I were talking on the way to services this morning. She was asking a question uh, uh, about a particular issue. I won't go into the whole conversation, but I made the observation to her. The, the issue is we, we just forget. We just get so busy with life. We're getting up and going to work or we're dealing with the kids or we're dealing with our health or we're dealing with this and dealing with that with the politics and the, and the football games and the holidays and whatever it is. We get so tunnel vision and so... Uh, temporally minded, and, and we're not doing it necessarily on purpose. We, we aren't, hey, I think I'll just forget about spiritual things today. Life just happens. And, and it requires a lot of discipline to keep thinking about the Lord's coming back on April the 24th. It requires a tremendous amount of discipline. And that's where we share the common need for these admonitions. And here they are. What is it that Peter tells us? And again, our, 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 our kind of context for today is the Lord's coming April the 24th. Number one, God's coming. God assures us in this passage of Scripture that He is going to bring the world to an end. And, and it's interesting because this passage begins with people who are doubting such. And the first thing that Peter would have us to understand is the Lord's coming back. The day of the Lord will come. And I want you to appreciate the way that Peter describes it. Let's kind of start here. No, no matter what people want to do in regards to doubt, what God wants us to understand is this is not going to be a pleasant experience for most folks when the Lord comes. April the 24th, 2024... It's going to be an ugly day. Don't worry about the weather forecast. <laughs> There's a lot bigger problem going to be. How is it that Peter describes the coming of the Lord? He, he uses terms like destruction and perdition and judgment, great noise, great heat, fire, the end of things, the passing away of things, the dissolution, the dissolving of things, and nothing survives. I don't know how much thought you've given to that. I've never been in a circumstance where nothing survives. Have you? Uh, we've been through some pretty devastating hurricanes in our part of the world. Uh, and uh, I'm reminded, for instance, when uh, I guess it was Rita that came in and, and the, the beaches uh, south of Lake Charles, uh, I forget the name of the community down there, it was just gone. And then I came in, and the beaches along Bolivar Peninsula and Crystal Beach, they were just gone. But what, what do you always see on the news? There's always this one house. It was this yellow house. You remember over here in Bolivar? And everybody went, what in the world? The wildfires in Maui this past year. There's this one house, and it looks like nothing ever happened to it, and everything around it is just burned to a crisp. Well, I got news for you. When the Lord comes, there's not going to be that one house. Everything you can imagine, and, and this is hard to wrap your head around, but it is something that Peter underscores over and over in the description. It's going to be gone. Not just the stuff. Everything. You know, this is not a new concept when Peter writes about this. In fact, I, I kind of wonder if some of the doubt comes because of what you find in the Old Testament. There are passages in the Old Testament, for, for instance, uh, Psalm 122, uh, 20, yeah, 102, verse 22 and following. Uh, there is a description of God and His power and His ability to not only speak things into existence, but to take the world and everything in it and the universe and to fold it up as a garment and put it away. And that's the way the psalmist describes God's ability to, to bring the world to an end. You find other passages. Uh, uh, Amos uh, addresses this, uses this imagery. Micah uses this imagery. That if the Lord would descend to the earth, that the mountains would just melt away. And I think even those men very often are reflecting upon God's descriptions of judgment in the Old Testament. If you turn, keep your bookmark in, there in, in 2 Peter. I want you to look at two passages right quick. I want you to turn to the book of Joel. Uh, in the book of Joel, in chapter 2, uh, God makes reference, or there is reference made to what is essentially a locust plague, that God's going to bring judgment upon His people. And the way that God describes this period of judgment 
is with the use of a phrase that becomes very, very common in the Old Testament. Look at Joel chapter 1, first of all, in verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. If you, if you take notes in your Bible, underline day of the Lord. You find this concept in Joel, Isaiah, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah. Over and over and over, especially the prophets that are, that are preparing the children of Israel for the impending Assyrian and Babylonian captivity, God keeps using this terminology. If you're still there in Joel, if you look over to chapter 2, you get the, the images. Verse 1, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any after them, even for many successive generations. If you're still in chapter 2, go down to verse 10. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before His army. His camp is very great. The uh, strong is the one who executes His word. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can endure it? And then if you go down to verse 28, or actually verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The other passage I'd have you to turn to is if you flip back to Isaiah. Uh, flip back to Isaiah, and I want you to, to look at chapter 13 with me very quickly. Isaiah 13, begin reading in verse 4. Isaiah 13 and verse 4. The noise of a multitude in the mountains like that of many people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts musters His army for battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. The Lord and His weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. All hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt. They'll be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They'll be in pain like a woman in childbirth. And they'll be amazed at one another. And they will, their faces will be like flames. The day of the Lord comes with wrath and fierce anger to the lay of the land desolate, and He will destroy its sinners from it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not give it their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Now that's just a glimpse of descriptions that you find all over the Old Testament and the New Testament. That, that, ref, that, that reflect on God's judgment, and they describe everything from a locust plague in Joel to an Assyrian captivity or Babylonian captivity in, in, in Isaiah or in Zephaniah or, or in Matthew. Jesus uses the same language in Matthew chapter 24 to describe first the destruction of, of, of Jerusalem and then the end of the world. If, 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 if you knew that on April 24th, 2024, this was the weather forecast. Would it get your attention? Peter would have us to understand the Lord's coming. Don't doubt it. Don't think you can explain it away. Don't be like the scoffers here. I, I kind of wonder, if you go back to 2 Peter, he, he says in verse 3, Know this, that scoffers will come in the last day, saying, where's the promise of His coming? Everything's the way it's always been. Do you realize that Peter is writing anywhere from 500 to 700 years after those descriptions we just read? Why, why do you think people in Peter's day say, the, the Lord's not coming again? Well, because it's been five or 700 years since God even wrote about those things. Why should we believe that the Lord's coming again? Well, such is the day in which we live. Peter's reminder is, first of all, the Lord's coming again. Secondly, his reminder is, there's proof that the Lord's coming again. And the proof is in the veracity of God's Word. Look at verse 1, the way that Peter starts this. Beloved, I write to you in the second epistle, 
in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of us, the, the, and the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. When there is doubt, Peter's re, re, reply to this is, well, first of all, these, these people go back to verse 3, they're walking according to their own lusts. You, you know, if you just objectively, honestly look at Scripture and, and, and try to, to judge its merit upon its face, you're going to be confronted with some realities. And the reality in this passage is God has made a lot of prophecies that came true. That's the argument. Why, why should I remember the prophets when people are doubting that the Lord was going to come? Well, Peter's first argument is that, uh, because they've already forgotten about the flood. They're walking according to their own lust. They don't care what's going to happen on April the 24th. It doesn't matter to them. They don't believe that the Lord's coming on April the 24th. And, and, and as a result of that, it really doesn't make any difference to them. They willfully forget. What, what do they forget? That God says things and then does them. That's what they forget. It is interesting to me. Peter even makes this argument back a, a, a couple of chapters earlier at the end of chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 16. He talks about being there at the transfiguration. He said, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. We told you what we saw when the Lord was transfigured before our very faces. But at the end of that very statement in verse 19, he says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed. The prophetic word confirmed. I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, for what it's worth. You didn't ask, but I'm going to give it to you because I'm preaching this morning. The greatest evidence that we have for our faith is not the resurrection. And, and, and I say that carefully because the resurrection has a huge impact upon our faith. But the greatest evidence is all the things that God said He would do and then did it years later that we can prove. You, you know, I can't prove the resurrection from the dead. I just can't. I'd like to be able to. I'd like to be able to walk to, to, to Israel and go outside Jerusalem and find the very tomb and, and show you that it's empty. But there'd be all kinds of arguments for why I shouldn't believe that it's empty. But i tell you what I can do. I can show you passages in the Old Testament where God said, I'm going to do this to Egypt, I'm going to do this to Assyria, I'm going to do this to Israel, I'm going to do this to Judah, I'm going to do this to Ahab, I'm going to do this uh, to this particular person. And every time that God said He's going to do something, you can go and find sometimes years, sometimes decades, sometimes centuries, where God did exactly what He said He was going to do, in the very way He said He was going to do it. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, in chapters 42, 43, 44, 45, there's a section there where God is ridiculing the Israelites because they believe in idols. And one of the arguments that he makes is, bring forth your predictions about what's going to happen. Tell us the things that are coming, and then show us that they came, and then we'll believe that you are divine. Somebody asked, and we live in a day of much more skepticism now than Peter lived in. Peter's dealing with people for whom God's predictions were hundreds of years old. It's been 2,000 years since the Lord came to the earth and told us He was coming back. It's been 2,000 years, roughly, since Peter wrote these words. And people have the same mentality. You know, if the Lord was going to come, why wouldn't He have come already? And, and, and Peter's reaction to that, and our reaction is, you need to go back and look at who God is and what He says and the fact that He always, 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 always does exactly what He said He was going to do. So the second observation is, I know the Lord's coming back because of the prophets and the apostles because God's Word provides evidence. Third observation. We're not going to have any warning. Nobody's going to be able to get up on December the 31st and say, the Lord's coming on April the 4th, 24th. It's not going to work that way. It may be December 31st that the Lord returns again. 
It may be April 23rd. It, it may be April 23rd in the year 3000 and something. Who knows? I don't know. But what Peter argues beginning in verse 8 is, you need to understand something about the way God works. First of all, he says, God is not subject to time. And I think this is an important consideration. And especially for maybe you younger folks who haven't thought this through. God does not live in the universe in which we live. Why is today December the 31st, 2023? Uh, well, I'll tell you why. Because the sun comes up and the sun goes down. Well, technically, the earth goes round and the earth goes round. And we measure everything, everything in our life relative to the sun. Everything. That's why so many cultures have worshipped it. I am 61 plus years old. I'm only 61 plus years old because of how many days I've been on the earth relative to how many times it's gone around the sun. That's the only way I measure that. And we measure everything that way. So if something's been, you know, what, what was it they were... Well, pick, pick any football game uh, that's been going on the last few days. Oh, it's been 10 years since this school did this. Or it's the first time in their history. That's the way we measure everything. And so we look at this and say, well, it's been 2,000 years. I just did it a minute ago. It's been 2,000 years since Peter wrote these words. Why hasn't the Lord come back? That's a long time. Not to God. Because God doesn't live under the sun. He, he doesn't measure time the way we measure time. And, and it's hard to wrap your head around that. How, how, how does that work? I don't know. But Peter's argument is, God's not looking at this the way we're looking at it, going, man, it's been so long. If I'm going to do this, I better do it. Or, or people aren't going to believe it anymore because it's been 2,000 years. That's why Peter says... A thousand years with the Lord is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. He's not measuring things the way that we do. His point is he's not slack concerning his promise. He is going to come. But he's not going to give you any clues. Let me say this at the very outset of this point. Nothing in this passage, nothing in 2 Peter chapter 3, harmonizes with premillennial doctrine. Nothing. What God says to us is, you better be ready because nobody's going to stand up and say it's April 24th. The Lord will come as a thief in the night. Jesus uses the same imagery back in Matthew. In fact, flip back to Matthew right quick. Look, turn to Matthew chapter 24. The apostles, uh, after Jesus has been in the temple with them in Jerusalem... And they go out to the Mount of Olives, uh, which would have overlooked the temple. And, and, and the apostles come to him in Matthew 24 because Jesus has told them, you see all these buildings, you see this temple, you see all these great stones, it's all going to be destroyed. And so they come and they ask this question uh, in, uh, I'm in Luke, in, in Matthew 24, uh, when is this going to happen? And, and, and what are the signs of this happening? And, and then what's the signs of the end of the age? So Jesus starts talking to them about what's going to happen. First thing he tells them is, there are going to be a lot of people that are going to try to mislead you. Don't pay attention to them. You'll know when all this is going to happen, he says a little later in Matthew 24, when you see the sign that was prophesied by Daniel, when the city is surrounded by, by foreign armies, then Jerusalem's about to be destroyed. That's why he says, get out of town, get out of Dodge. But, but then he says, towards the end of the chapter, in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, uh, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from it. There's that day of the Lord language. And the powers of the earth will be shaken. Then the sun, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. All the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send his angels out with the sound of a trumpet and they'll gather together as elect from the four winds in the end of heaven to, from, from one to the other. His point is, you don't want to know what the sign of the Lord's coming is? The Lord's coming. <laughs> when you look up and you see the Lord's coming, that's the only sign you're going to get. In fact, he illustrates it. 
Now learn this parable from the fig tree. This has always been fascinating to me. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. Have you ever thought that through? When do plants bloom and, and put leaves out? When it gets warm, right? And, and what he says is, when that happens, you know the summer is near. Well, wait a minute. That's not going to happen until the summer is near. It's already started getting warm enough for all that. that do we really need to see that the plants are, are leafing out to know that summer's coming? And I think the point that he's making is, do you really think you're going to get a better sign than the Lord's coming when the Lord comes? And that's why you get to chapter 25 and he says, you need to be ready. Tells the parable of the, of the virgin and the wedding feast and the ones that were wise and the ones that were foolish. And the point of the story is you need to be ready all the time. Because if he comes at midnight or a time you're not looking for, if he comes April the 23rd instead of April the 24th, you better be ready. Then he tells the, the parable about the talents. And the point of that parable is you better be doing something. Now, let me say this relative to how we started this study. Are you going to make any progress spiritually in the coming year? I promise you, if you knew the Lord was coming on April the 24th, you'd be a different person for the next four months than you are right now. I promise you. No doubt in my mind. Just because we don't know that He's coming that day doesn't mean we need to take it any less seriously. That's the point of you better be using what you have for the good of the master, the parable of the talents, why you've got the time, because you just don't know when the master's coming back. And then you get into of Matthew chapter 25, and you get the judgment scene. I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. It's going to happen, and you better have been doing some good with what you have and helping other people. This would be the, the main admonition that I would make to us today from this point. We need to know the Lord's coming at any time. We need to be ready. We need to be working. And we need to be paying attention to each other and to everybody else because that's what's important to God. Because when He comes, He's not going to give us any warning. And that brings the last point, and that is the, the most ironic part of the chapter. In verse 12... Or actually, verse 11. Since all these things will be dissolved, and notice the language again, <laughs> everything around you is just going to... What kind of person should you be? Well, that's a legitimate question because I want to make sure I'm on the Lord's side. So there's the holy conduct and godliness. This is the stuff where you'll be working on. But look at verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Again, in verse 14, beloved, looking forward to these things. Let me ask you something. How do you feel about the Lord's return? This is an easier question, I think, as you get older. You get older and you deal with all the, the, the difficulties and frustrations of life. You, you lose people that you love. You, you go to more funerals. Th things hurt. Your body starts decaying. You become frustrated with the world and the way, the direction, the things are going. And the older you get, and, and, and especially when you lose people that you love and, you know, you look forward to uh, seeing all these folks that have meant so much to you. And so somebody asks somebody that's 75 or 80 years old, if the Lord came today, would you be okay with that? That'd be, oh, are you kidding? I wish you'd have come yesterday. But when you're younger, you're raising your kids, you got your whole life in front of you, you think of all the things you're going to do, you think of how things are going at work, you think of all, you just, life is so attractive. Are you looking forward to the Lord's coming? Are you hastening it? Are you pushing for it? Do you want it, do you want it to happen? And he sets that in contrast to everything's going to be burned up. But not God's people. If we went back in 
Thessalonians, when Paul writes to them about the second coming, he said, you know, when the Lord comes again, there's going to be a shout and a trumpet, and the Lord's going to appear, just as Jesus mentioned back in Matthew 24. And, and, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first, which means if I'm still alive when the Lord comes again, I'm going to get to see the resurrection. And, and, you know, if you watch very many zombie movies, that's kind of a scary thing, but not for God's people. It's not the way it's going to be. And then the rest of us are going to be changed. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and we'll always be with Him. And we'll be in resurrected bodies. And I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but I guarantee it'll be worth whatever God asks of us here. And we need to embrace that because what we don't want to do is face the second coming unprepared where all the destruction that's going on around us is simply a precursor to our own. Jesus said in John chapter 5 that there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. It is described a little bit later in the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 25, later in Jesus' life, as, as, as a resurrection unto everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You're going to go home this afternoon. You might give a little thought to the things that we're talking about right now. And, and, and you might kind of think, you know, I, 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 really, I really need to do better. And you might even consider some specific things. I, I hope you will. But here's what I really hope. I really hope that tomorrow in the middle of one of the big football games that are so important to us, Landy's got his hound's tooth on. I do too. Did you notice that? I, I, I know who's bread to butter at my house. In the middle of the Alabama game, all that matters is if the Lord comes before the second half, will I be ready, and is that something I'd love to happen? And I really hope that the next week you have those same thoughts. And I hope a month from now you have those same thoughts. And I hope six months from now, if the Lord doesn't come on April the 24th, you have those same thoughts. And I really hope that every one of us will live every day with the anticipation that today could be the day. And I hope it is. And I'm ready. And I'm working. And I'm doing all I can. Because when we mark the passing of time and the ends of things and the beginning of things, it ought to remind us that life's going to have an end and eternity's going to have a beginning and I'm going to be there. As Peter says, what country do you belong to? Whose side are you on? I hope you'll think about those things as the day goes along. Thanks so much for your attention this morning. And... Uh, May we all do better in the coming year. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, we could help you. We invite your response while we stand.